What's going on guys? Today's video is a replacement for a video I just took down uh, and I felt like I need to kind of make a statement on it. Uh, the video is entitled How to Choose a Nimpo Instructor and I got a lot of feedback on that video. Um, some good, some bad and I can take all of it. One of the guys who reached out to me really made an impact. He said he'd been searching for some schools, he's been visiting some schools and uh, he was down to making a decision and before he made a decision, he came across my video. And he was excited to watch it because he felt it may have some inside information on what someone should look like when they're joining any type of martial arts school. And my video was more of a rant about no matter what your instructor is or who he is or what style you're training in, if you want it to be effective, that a percentage of that personal responsibility came down to yourself. Um, no matter how many times your teacher had been to Japan or Brazil or China or wherever your system you're training at or how good he was, your ability to extract that information from that teacher and from that system uh, was uh, is a big part of how you become a martial artist. Uh, if you wait around for a teacher to hold your hand and show you everything, uh, you're going to waste a lot of people's time. But when that instructor can show you things and you can research and develop things along the journey with that instructor um, so he doesn't have to show you every single thing uh, it becomes a big help and and that's really what I wanted to put out that no matter what style of martial arts you study uh, the responsibility of how good you become or how effective that material is lies on your personal training again I understand being with the right school the right teacher the right environment uh, having things pressure tested field tested sparring with it making it work all of those things are important. Uh, but even if you're in a school or there's no schools around you that offer that, and I guarantee there is, but if there isn't or you haven't found one, in the meantime, you need to put in the work yourself. That's kind of what the whole video was about. Had nothing to do about finding a martial arts school in any style or system. And if someone searching that video is gonna spend some time to sit down and watch it, and I don't wanna make sure I'm misleading. So I took that video down. In replacement of that video, I'd like to show NIMPO students or, or martial art enthusiasts that if you're interested in NIMPO, what that could possibly look like. A lot of people don't know what's entailed in training in a NIMPO school. And depending upon what organization you're with or what teacher you're with, there's a lot of diversity and that's a great thing. But to find what you're looking for, you can't go traveling around from state to state, country to country, dojo to dojo, teacher to teacher, to put it all together. And in most cases, it's not all in one place. So what I've had to do in my lifetime was take the best from this system, the best from this teacher, the best from this teacher. And over my lifetime, if I found something that worked and I found something I liked and it was important and it was a building block, I added it to my curriculum. Um, so I want to take a little time today to show you what a NIMPO curriculum could look like. All right, let's take a look at a few things. This is my basic curriculum. This is the curriculum that I teach from here uh, at my home dojo. One of the things I want to say up front is this curriculum is very customizable. I allow my instructors to modify uh, each curriculum uh, to suit their own skill sets, their own background, their own personality, um, the things that they want their students to learn in addition to uh, a core fundamentals. Um, there's things in here that I make all of my instructors um, learn, and there's things in here that I, I, I want all of my instructors to teach to their students. Um, that foundation is what makes all of us the United States NIMPO Academy. Uh, if everybody just did their own things, um, then we wouldn't really have a cohesive group. But in my opinion, um, this program here will help guide somebody through not only the basics of NIMPO, um, but also self-defense and give them the ability to uh, survive. So this, this goes in a little bit about a history about myself, and then let's just take a look at it. So this is level 10, this is white belt, right? And uh, we start off with everything I want you to notice if it's in red, this is something that all the schools must do in unison. This is something that each instructor needs to teach. Uh, I do give them some flexibility to be able to teach it in their own ways, but I want them to cover this type of material and if possible, if it's a physical movement, I want there to be some resemblance across the board. So all the different groups are doing something relatively similar. 
Um, it doesn't have to be exactly the same, but there needs to be a common denominator that I can recognize. But uh, basically, you're going to start off with how to enter a, uh, enter a martial arts school. I, I've got some basic greetings here. Ohio gozaimasu, good morning. Konnichiwa, good afternoon. Konbawa, good evening. We talk about how to bow into the mats, and when you leave the mats, and then what onegeshimasu means, as in please respect and or teach me. So you've learned how to enter into a traditional training space, whether it be inside, outside, or wherever. Those are some of the greetings and some of the formalities you need to enter a training space. The next thing is you need to learn how to sit down. So we talk about seiza. This is the traditional Japanese way of sitting down on your knees. And then seiza re. This is basically how to bow in. Then we get into uh, the kotodama. Um, this is basically how to organize every individual into a line and to be able to do some type of uh, benediction or some type of uh, pattern that brings everyone together. And in Nimpo, you have uh, something called Shiken Harumitsu Dai Komyo. It's followed by a, a bunch of claps, uh, and they're done to unite the class and to awaken the spirits and to just get everyone ready for training. And I've got a whole video on Shiken Harumitsu Dai Komyo. Uh, if you want to go and check that out. Um, the next step is after, so basically they learn how to walk into a dojo. They've learned how to sit down. They've learned how to bow in, in a traditional Nimpo way. So if they went and trained with a different type of grandmaster, there was a Taikai seminar or even his class inside of his home dojo. So far, you've learned how to bow into the front door. You learned how to walk onto the mats. You've learned how to sit down and you've learned how to bow in. Now you're kind of ready to train. Things you need to learn next is the kamai. These are attitudes. So I've just got two basic kamais, shizen no kamai and katata ichimonji no kamai. These are basically two stances or attitudes that you need to be able to begin training. So now that you know how to stand in some type of stance to be able to do martial arts, you have to be able to learn how to like attack. So we've got a couple different attacks that are here. Again, this is all white belt. You have fudokan, which is a conventional fist. Then you have Omote and Ura Shuto Kitan Kens. And then you have Sokuyaku Ken, which is a basic kick with the heel of your foot. So you basically have some closed fist punches. We have two open hand punches and one kick. So you've learned how to walk into a dojo. You learned how to do all the formalities. You learned how to sit down. You learned how to bow in. You learned how to stand in a stance and you've learned how to attack. The next thing you have to be able to do is learn how to defend. This is Jodan, Chudan, Gedan, Uke. Upper level, middle, and lower level blocks. So you've learned how to do some attacks. Now you're learning how to do some blocks. The next section right here is Ukemi. This is teaching you how to fall. Zempo Kemi, Koho Kemi, Yoko Kemi. So this is teaching you how to fall. So if you punch in and somebody blocks, punches you back, you fall down, you know how to be able to do some type of a break fall. You punch in, they throw you to the ground, you learn how to fall in a way where you can protect yourself. So you can see how this progression of being able to just bow into the mat, sit down, stand up, get into a stance, be able to punch, be able to block, and be able to fall. They're the very first things that you learn when you train in the school. The next section here, we have two of the roles. These are the kaitens. Um, these are ways to escape. You have zempo kaiten, which is your forward role, and koho kaiten, which is your backwards role. Next is your shinobi movement. We teach people the front stealth. We're going to teach people how to walk, how to put their feet on the ground silently, how to distribute their weight without their head bouncing up and down. Um, so you're teaching them to move across the floor, move up and down steps, move through grass, move through high grass, go through snow, go through different environments by using your feet to put them down the ground. So there's a whole section here on stealth or front movement. Um, 360 degree spin to be able to see all around how to get down to the ground and how to be able to stand up. So if you're moving along and something happens, how do we get down quietly, softly, be in a position where you can see and you could also fire a weapon. Next, we get into shinobi sounds and signals. And I'm just putting these shinobi sounds and signals, but basically they're just sound and signals. When I put the word shinobi, these things can be done by a military unit, which I learned them in the Marine Corps, or you can be passed down as far as a communication source within your dojo. So we've got some different sounds that we make uh, with like clicks of uh, tss, 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 things you can make that sound like insects that you can communicate with someone in the woods. 
And then you've got hand and arm signals so you can communicate with each other without speaking. So this sound and signal right here, once you learn how to move around in the woods or move around in an environment and you're learning how to be quiet, the next thing you got to be able to do is be able to communicate with making very little to no sound through hand and arm signals or by sounds that don't sound like a human being. And those are 10 sections right there that breaks up what I would consider to be white belt. Those are the first things that you learn. The next thing that's very important with the United States Nipple Academy is we have some way to track that. So every time that you learn something, the date that you learned it, the instructor that you taught it, will put his initials right there. When the student feels very comfortable with it, he'll put his initials there. And then once the instructor and the student have initials there, you'll, you're eligible to do a pretest on that particular movement. If you pass that, then you're ready to go. Once you have all of the instructor's initials, you've practiced it, you feel comfortable, you've personally signed off on it, and you've actually shown it to a, a, an instructor, and they've agreed, they've also initialed, so you can learn it from one instructor and another instructor can sign off for it. But if you're like the head instructor, I can see what date it was originally taught, who taught it, who pre-tested it, who said it was okay. Then once everything is signed off, then that student is now eligible to test. Some of my instructors, they'll test people on individual things. So in, in once you've got everything figured out, if you're ready to do Fudoken, they'll watch you do Fudoken and they'll initial off on it. And then once everything has been initial, initialed off on it, you may do a run through of everything in a 15 minute little demonstration and then you've passed white belt and you move on to the next test. Other instructors, once everything's been pre-tested off, then they'll come together and then do one entire test and show every single thing and get everything signed off. So there's a couple of different ways that you can test. But all the material that you learn is actually tested on. And that would make you a white belt. The next Q is QQ, which is a yellow belt. First thing we learn is the Go Gyo no Kata, which is also known as the Son Shin, which is teaching you Chi, Sui, Ka, Fu, Ku, different ways of movements connected to uh, different earth, water, fire, wind, and air. And you notice I have the colors that coordinate with those earth symbols and the directions, earth being north, water being west, fire being south. Um, so these will come away along because you're learning this Go Gyo no Kata uh, and, and you're learning these earthly elements and you're learning to put them together. And these colors and these directions are going to play a factor later on. Next, you have something called the San Po no Kata. This basically comes from Gyokuru, but you're learning Ichimonji no Kata, Jumonji no Kata, and Hicho no Kata. So these are forms that are in Gyokuru that's teaching the student to be able to put blocks and punches together. In white belt, you learn how to punch and you learn how to block. In this section here, we're learning how to put those blocks and punches together to try to get you moving. Again, you're, you're only a white belt. You may have been training maybe four, five, six months. So you're really starting to put things together here as far as punching combinations. Then kicking with Gyokuru again, we're working on a mote onura, uh, uragyaku from the Kihon Waza. So you're looking on a mote gyak, uragyak. This is basically being able to Someone comes up and grabs you, remove the grip, take them down to the ground. Someone punches in, being able to block, hurt the hand, take that hurt hand, be able to break the wrist. Number three, number four is Hapotenchi Tobi. This is the eight laws of leaping. So we're learning how to leap to get away from danger. Um, this is important. Someone's doing a, a very hard kick, spinning back fist, uh, Superman punch. They have a baseball bat. They have a sword. They, they have a crowbar. They have a knife, learning how to leap and get as much distance as you can from your attacker. So in this section here, we work on Hapotenchi Tobi to make people understand that when you can't stand in that position to fight and you need to gain some space, you have to be able to learn how to leap athletically to get as much space as you can. Moving on to number five, we have some of the basic kicks. So we have Sokuyaku Ken, Sokugyaku Ken, Sokushi Ken, Sokuto Ken, and Soki Ken. This is basically kicking with the heel, the ball, the toes, the edge, and your shin. So this is kind of the basics of kicking. So right now we're in yellow belt and we're learning all the different kicks. We're going to learn to do those kicks against someone holding like a focus pad or a heavy bag. You're going to learn how to develop those kicks. And then you're going to start to apply them in your sparring. So with your, your punches and your blocks and your open hand strikes, you're going to start to put a little bit of diversity in your different abilities to kick with different parts of your feet. So again, in yellow belt, now we're going to get introduced to the sword. This is Kenjutsu Kihon, 
So basically, this is coming from Kukushinru. We're going to learn some of the kamais. These are some of the stances in the sword. So you're going to go through seven of the kamai of Kukushinru. You're going to learn not only the stance, but you're going to learn the feeling behind that stance so you know when to take on that attitude or when to take on that kamai. So again, this is in yellow belt. You get introduced to the sword. Then you learn the seven basic cuts. So you've learned how to stand in seven stances. Now you're going to be able to do seven cuts. And you're going to be able to do these cuts from all seven stances. So this is showing me that you can not only stand properly with a sword, but you can perform basic cuts. And then eventually we'll work that into against tatami, where you're actually learning how to cut against uh, something with resistance. <clears throat> this is Kenjutsu Ukemi. Now we're learning the blocks. So you've learned how to stand in a stance. You learn how to do the cuts. Now you're learning how to block. So this is the introduction to the sword. Again, this is in yellow belt. Uh, the next section here is how to wear your uniform. And uh, I give some basic traditional names of the traditional Shinobi uniform, which is shown here. But we also talk about a modern ghillie suit. Um, the uniform here was used to be able to move comfortably back in the old days, to be able to camouflage your face, to be able to keep things from rubbing together, making noise, to be able to move silently. Same thing with the modern day ghillie suit. The last thing here, you have a 10 second head start with a five minute search. We call this Ongyo Jitsu. Basically, this is your first introduction to stealth. This is using some of the stealth movements we talked about, some of the hand and arm signals if you're moving in groups, to be able to run either in a, a wooded environment or an urban environment, to be able to find overlapping shadows, to be able to find cover and concealment, and to be able to get distance from your opponent. So you have a 10 second head start and then a team of individuals are given five minutes to basically locate your position. Again, this is yellow belt and this is your first exposure to kind of shinobi movements. You get somebody that's never been out in the woods and never ran through spider woods, spider webs or the understanding of the different terrain when you're moving in the woods and how things can drop off and roots and sticker bushes and thorn bushes or diving into poison ivy. There's all kinds of things that go along with this. Some people will run and just kind of lay down thinking they're covered, um, but they don't understand how the shadows can move with the clouds and the moon and how things can change. So there's a lot that you learn when you're laying down and you're hearing people stalking you down. The way you control your heart rate, the way you control your breathing. So this is an introduction to a lot of things. In the beginning, it may start off as just kind of like a, an adult version of hide and seek, and it may start off like that for everyone. But eventually it grows and grows and grows and grows. It gets more serious. There's more things you have to be able to do. How fast can you move with that 10 second head start? Can you understand what shadow trails and animal trails are? Have you, have you gotten better at moving silently without leaving trace evidence behind you? When you find cover and concealment, can you get down and pull things in around you, cut things down to put them to break up your neck and shoulder area to be able to blend? Can you meditate and control your heart rate and your breathing? All these things come into play as you develop. That is the 10 sections that break up what a yellow belt now is training. And then again, you're tested on all of that material. Um, and you see here that this stuff is here is what is required by all the students. And then this is something that is I teach here at my dojo. And this is where I give my my instructors a chance to kind of customize some things in this section right here. So if they if they want to continue to do this, that's great. They can do this and they can continue to add on to it. But again, you see how this stuff here is not really tested by the whole group. So this may be confusing to some, but again, every every academy works on this stuff. This is what the instructor would add in at his own school, and then he can choose whether he wants to test that material or just teach that material. Moving along to Orange Belt, Hachiku, <clears throat> Zempo Kaiten Ukemi, forward rolling brake fall. We start to pull a little bit of speed. Uh, I make them jump over people, make them jump over shakobos or bojutsu uh, to land on the ground. We actually throw people. So they're learning how to fall from being thrown. They're learning how to fall from, from types of heights. So that's what Zempo Kaiten Ukemi is. Next, we move into a couple of different more advanced roles. Yoko Nagare, Jun Nagare, these are more flowing type water-like rolls. And then we get into Oten, uh, which is the cartwheel. Again, a lot of these are escapes, ways of moving to get distance from A to B. So this here is taught in this section. 
Now they're introduced to Bojutsu. <clears throat> this is a Rishaka Bo to six foot staff. Again, they're going to learn all of the different Kamais and the feelings connected with the six foot staff. All the way down. So we have all the different Kamais. Once they've learned the Kamais and they can do all the Kamais and understand the feelings, they get into the strikes. So I've got 10 different strikes. Yoko Men, Migido, which is to the body. So there's 10 different strikes that they learn with the Rokushaku Bo. So they learn all the stances and then they learn the 10 strikes. And then again, they go back and take those 10 strikes and be able to do them from each of the different Kamais or stances. The next section is the Sabaki Evasions from the front with Shuriken. You're learning how to feel the intent right here. So basically what's happening is as you're cut with a sword, this is Daijinan Shomagri. So someone's cutting at you with a sword and you're learning how to avoid that cut by feeling the intent, using some of the rolls, the cartwheels and the leaping and the movement to be able to get away from that cut and then to be able to throw a shuriken accurately at the attacker. And yes, we're using rubber or cardboard shurikens. We're not throwing metal shurikens into our training partners. But you're learning how to be in a calm position. Shurikens hit him. An attack comes. You feel the intent. You move. You get away. You get a proper distance. Control your heart rate, your breathing, your form, your mentality. Grab your shuriken as the person comes to attack. Be able to throw your shuriken and escape and roll away again. And you put this all together from a bunch of different attacks with someone facing you. Now we're continuing with the um, Kion Hapo, you're getting into Mushadari, Musodari. Again, this is an orange belt level. You're learning those two techniques, and we're going to introduce you to some throws, Sotogake and Gansekinage. So here you get introduced to being able to throw. And then we've got some Tehodoke. This is removing from grips. Someone grabs the same side, two hands on one, one hand on both. You're learning how to avoid some grips. So you're learning that the thumb is the weakest finger. You're learning how to use your entire body to move to be able to escape these types of grips. So if you're reaching for a secondary weapon, whether it be a firearm or a sword or a knife, and someone reaches and grabs your hand to stop you from getting that weapon, you know how to get the hand free to be able to draw that weapon. And again, since Shuriken Jitsu is in this section with the sword, we have the whole introduction to Shuriken Jitsu here. You learn how to uh, throw from different types of positions, from a standing position, from a kneeling position, even from a rolling position. Um, and then these are different ways of throwing the shurikens with different movements where someone attacks you. You learn to defend yourself, to get the space that you need to be able to draw your shurikens to be able to throw. And then number 10 in this section is throwing shurikens. You've got to get 7 out of 10 to actually hit the main target. Um, and we're throwing from probably about 30 feet would be uh, uh, 10 yards or so where we're at um, the throw. And we're using uh, like a Baker target, which is the head and body silhouette of it there. And then, you know, I talk about the different types of shurikens um, that are available here. So that breaks out your, your orange belt training. And then again, you're tested on everything there. This is a Nanikyu, which is your, your green belt. We're getting into a Mote and Ura Onokodaki. We're getting into Kenjutsu. A Mote and Ura Onokodaki are just techniques done against the elbow as an outside form and an in, inside form. And again, I'm not going to teach all of this stuff today, but I want to show you what a curriculum of a Nimpo school could possibly look like. And there's thousands of these out there. This just happens to be mine. Um, next is Kenjutsu two-man drills. So we worked with some swords. You learn how to stand. You learn how to cut. You learn how to block. Now we're going to do some two-man drills where you're actually working on that speed and resistance of like a live timing cut. So this is teaching you a little bit of ronderi. This is kind of not so much free sparring, but controlled sparring. You don't know when the person is going to cut. You don't know how hard they're going to be cutting. You've got to be able to react to it and move. So these drills are teaching you how to move quickly against hard cuts. We're using wooden or bamboo swords in this section here um, to be able to teach people to get offline, be able to block, and be able to cut back with some type of pace and with some type of resistance of somebody cutting in hard. Next section is Tanto Jitsu. You're going to learn some, some kamais with the, uh, with the knife or with the blade, and then some cuts. So you're going to learn how to hold the knife correctly, and you're going to learn how to do some basic cuts with the Tanto in this section here. Section four is the Koho Sabaki. 
This is very much like what we did in the front when someone cuts at you with a sword. You learn to escape. You learn to get distance. You learn to throw your shuriken at the swordsman. This is the same thing, but now your back is to the cutter. So you have to be able to sense and feel the direction of the cut. And yes, at this section here, which is green belt, you know what cut is coming. You don't necessarily know when it's coming, but you know what direction the opponent's cutting at. And again, this is a starting point. This is where we start the training. Eventually, any of these cuts could come anywhere and you're gonna receive them with no ki, and you've gotta be able to sense what part of your body is being attacked, when it's being attacked, how to move correctly. So that's very difficult to do when, you're, when your back is turned to your cutter and you don't know what attack he's coming at. So this is teaching you the basic ways to move when he's cutting at your legs, when he's cutting at your shoulder, when he's cutting at your kneecaps. There's different techniques that will give you an advantage to be able to escape, again, to be able to draw your own weapon or to grab your shuriken or a bush to be able to defend yourself. So that's kind of what the uh, that section right there is. Now you're going to get introduced to the hambo, which is the three-foot staff. You're going to learn the kamais, kata yabari, munen muso, utanashi. We talk about the attitudes, the feelings. And then you get into some of the hambo kihon. These are techniques that are done uh, with the hambo. So you've got 10 techniques here to be able to use the hambo to understand all the movements. Next, you're going to get introduced to manriki kusari. <clears throat> Since the Bujinkan, the Genbukan, uh, doesn't really have a Manriki Sari. I know that the Jininkan does, and we may see that later. But Totoru is where I learned the majority of my Manriki Kusari. And um, this is kind of going to get you introduced to the different uh, stances and positions and movements from the Manriki Kusari from the chain. So we've got five different movements here teaching you the Manriki Kusari. Next section is to prevent takedowns. So this is a situation where we're talking about uh, Hagai Jume, which is a full Nelson. Someone comes up and puts you on a full Nelson. How do you escape it? Dodri, somebody comes and uh, tackles you around your waist. What do you do? Uh, Roashidri, somebody comes and tackles you and they're grabbing both your legs. They're kind of doing that, that jujitsu or that Greco-Roman wrestling type of drop to your knees. How do you defend yourself against someone coming up from behind you and getting you in a full Nelson? Someone coming up and getting your waist embraced, whether your hands or your not your hands. And what do you do if someone shoots for your legs? These are some of the techniques you learn how to defend yourself from there. Also, a sotogake, how to defend yourself against a leg swoop. Now we're continuing with number 10 here. <clears throat> now you've got a five second head start. In the earlier cues, you had a 10 second head start. This one here, you've got a five second head start. So this is you really stepping your game up a little bit more. You've got only five seconds to get a lead, and then you've got to be able to find cover and concealment to get down to where you're not detected. Um, we'll start off this with being able to find you and touch you, and then we'll work that into airsoft and paintball scenarios to where you've got people that are armed with weapons uh, and you have nothing, and you basically have to hide. Um, once you've been through that, where you're just basically unarmed and you're being stalked down, we'll move to where now you also have a weapon uh, and when you when people move into your kill zone, you learn how to be able to attack and move, attack and move. So again, we're at green belt, and this is the type of training that you've been exposed to so far. And then again, you're tested on all of that. <clears throat> then we have Rokiku, uh, which is your purple belt area. We're going to get more into Roshakubo, the six-foot staff. You're going to get exposed to Goho and Ra Goho. These are and these are staples uh, in the Roshakobo as far as patterns and techniques. Not only are you going to learn the Bojutsu side of them, but you're also going to learn the Kenjutsu side to be able to defend against these types of an attacks. So this is just an introduction to a little bit more of advanced uh, Roshakobo Jutsu, uh, learning how to move. Next is Shitsubatsu. This is defending against somebody throwing you. So this is if someone goes to throw you, sinking your weight, pushing your hips forward, using your free hands with your palms to strike into the pelvic griddle, uh, your open boshikens into the spine. Um, so this is stopping a judo type throw uh, by either using your, your weight, your hip positions, your angles, um, even your feet uh, to be able to stop that throw. So this is an introduction to if someone throws you, what are some of my basic defenses to stop that throw? Next session number three is close the gap and takedowns. 
this is where you're actually starting to get into fighting. This is where you're getting into I'm, I'm in a you know I'm in a confrontation. There's space between me and my opponent. Um, I know that I need to be able to take this person down to the ground. I've decided that that's going to be my best advantage. Maybe he's a, a boxer. Maybe he's a kickboxer. Maybe he's a kung fu guy. And I feel that my advantage is to be able to get him down to the ground, choke him out, kill him, break his bones, whatever I got to be able to do. But I've got to be able to close the gap and take this person down. So I've learned how to stop a judo type throw. But what if that's if we're connected? What if we're not connected and I need to close the gap? So we get into this section here. It teaches you how to be able to close that gap take the person down to the ground and gain an advantageous position. Now, once you're down on the ground, we got to be able to work on some things. So, osekomi means to pin down. So, we're going to work on like katagatame, kuzugasukatami, hijigatame, udegatame. We're going to learn some of the basics of jujitsu to be able to hold this person or be able to fight your way onto the ground. So, we've worked with hand-to-hand, -hand, locked up in like a judo type clinch. We've lurked on how to be able to close that gap, to be able to go down to the ground, and then once we get down to the ground, what to actually do. Then we get into some, some chokes. This is being held from the side. So this is kind of all front. This is from the side. And then we're also talking about held from above. So close the gap, take down. You're, on, you're in the mounted position. You're held from the side. You're held from the above. You've got the basics down. So you're basically learning Osei Komi. You're basically learning Jiu Jitsu. You're basically learning your ground game right here uh, in that purple belt area. Then we get into the Tanto Jitsu. This stuff is coming from the Jinru from Anaka Sensei, but it's basically just learning some Kamais with the Tanto Jitsu and then being able to, to fight from them. So what uh, Manaka Sensei does is he has each of the Kamai, so you have the sword, I'm sorry, you have the Tanto, and your person's cutting it with a sword from Daijodan and from Hasso. And then I have more but I couldn't put all this in the queue system where it'd be hundreds and hundreds of pages. So I had to just give you taste of certain things. So there's actually uh, seven Kamai, and then I've included a sword cut from Daijodan and Hasso. So you have a straight cut and an angle cut, and you have a knife. How do you defend against someone with a sword if you have a knife? So that section is an introduction there. Then we're getting deeper into Manriki Kusari. Uh, these are more advanced. Sorry, that's the chain with the two lead weights on the end of it. Uh, I'm pretty sure most people are familiar with Manrique Kusari is. Um, this is a rope version uh, of it. And I'm sure I got a chain version around here somewhere. This is like a chain version of that of that weapon. <clears throat> so you're getting involved in Manrique Kusari, moving that feather down the field with uh, some techniques. And then I'm getting even deeper with Kusari. So this stuff right here is Totoru, and then this stuff right here uh, is Jinru on the Kasari right here. So this has that in it. Then we got Hojo Jitsu, which is rope tying. So this is the art of being able to, you know, basically work with handcuffs or ropes or just tying somebody up. Um, you came across a situation and, and, and you've defended yourself and the person is kind of being resistant to you. Uh, this is teaching how to take some, take some rope and to be able to make handcuffs to be able to hold your opponent down. So this gives you some of the basics of what they call hojo jutsu or being able to tie somebody down. Now we're moving back to the hanbo. We're getting some more techniques, some more advanced techniques of the hanbo. Um, this is uh, uke grabs either your lapel or grabs your wrist. These are de dealing with techniques, moving with the hanbo. Next, number 10 here, we got being able to start a fire. So we're talking about survival skills here. So we're teaching people some of the basics, what tinder is, what kindling is, what fuel is, and the method uh, to do the bow and drill, or flint and steel, or mirror and glass, steel wool and a battery, talk about waterproof matches, just any ways that you can build a fire uh, on your own. Um, so we make people actually build a fire. So you've got to be able to you know, go out and collect some tinder and be able to show me that you can, you can make a fire. Uh, you're good to go. <clears throat> Next, we talk about building shelters. So we get all the students out there and we teach them how to build some type of, of a survival shelter that they can deal with there. So we talk about the fire, we talk about the reflector board, we talk about waterproofing, we talk about wind direction. Um, and sometimes we dig these out down here, we dig them out. So this folds down, you've actually got a fighting position down there, camouflage it right, and no one will ever know you're there. So that was the purple belt section. So lots of weapons, fire building skills, there's hambo in there, there was 
rope tying arts and then you end up the class with being able to build a shelter and then guess what you're tested on all of that again moving on to goku you start getting into togakuro biken the ninja side of the sword we did some kukishinru stuff now we're going to get into some of the togakuro stuff so we talk about how to use the ninja sword which is a little bit different smaller of a blade um, a little bit more in type grappling with this type of techniques than with the longer swords so this is a get introduction to the ninja toe or the ninja side of the sword and then we have the uh, togakuru taijutsu with the shuko this is a section in togakuru that teaches you how to deal with the the takagis um, the hand claws uh, and how to do the sections with that so that has the togakuru hand claws in it <clears throat> then you get into throws himself so we teach you a bunch of different throws, Seonage, Ippon Seonage, Tatenagare, Kurumagaishi, and Makikomi. So you, you learn a little bit of throws, how to be able to get these throws down and very proficient at them. Now, Yoko Shionage, these are kind of self-sacrificing throws. Then we have the Omote and Ura Kimiwazuropo. The Omote and Ura Kimiwazuropo is uh, techniques where you lock the arms up, and then the, down here, the... Uh, is the same thing where you're locking the arms up where they're laying on their stomach. So this is with them laying on their back, and this is with them laying on their stomach. But these are locks that you lock people up with. Then we get into the uh, Kujikiri. We get into the, uh, the the symbols of the Kujikiri, and we teach the students the basic mudras of Rin, Pyo, To, Sha, Kai, Jin, Retsu, Zai, Zen, the different cuts, the different hand postures, what the Ketsuens mean, um, and then I've got a whole book on this once they get past it. But this is just the basics of how to do the fundamental aspects of Kujikiri, what it's done for, how it's used to clear mental noise, how it's used to get focus. Um, and those are where I start. I start with being able to clear the mental noise, being able to focus, center yourself, uh, to have that mental fortitude to be able to accomplish your mission. So that's kind of where I start off with the Kujikiri. And for many years, I didn't even have this included in the system. Students wanted it, so I put some basics in here to get them started on that trail. <clears throat> then there's Kusari Gama. Uh, we talk about the Kamai for Kusari Gama. And then we talk about some of the techniques to be able to spin the chain and use the, and use the sickle to do some of the basics. So this is your introduction here to Kusari, Kusari Gama. <clears throat> then we get into some Shinobi sections here. We're talking about Sweeton, talking about techniques of skills to be with the water. So we've got all these different techniques of using, you know, to tread water normally, swimming with your katana on your back, uh, side strokes with both hands under the water, you know, basically teaching you how to survive, teach you how to swim. Um, swim has been a tough spot for me my whole life, but these techniques here I can do. Some of them are very difficult, especially treading water with your legs going in circles so you can have your hands available for fighting. Uh, I'm still working on some techniques from some water polo guys that are going to teach, you know, been trying to teach uh, me how to use my feet to be able to get my waist out of the water to be able to cut and to block and fight. So I'm, 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 I don't really have anybody in the ninja world sh other than teaching me the names and what it's supposed to be done. But I'll tell you, you work with some water polo guys, your swimming is going to get a whole bunch better. This is Kinton no Jitsu. This is working with metal, sound, and light. This is different aspects of working with those. These are used to distract people. These are used to scare people out of an area. These are used to draw people to an area. These are used to cause some type of like disorientation, confusion to give you an advantage. And then we have Mokutono Jitsu, which is the use of plants, trees, and woods. We've got information and techniques on how to be able to do that. Dotono Jitsu is using the ground, soil, and the earth. I've got some techniques again on that. And then katan, which is using fire or heat. There are some techniques on that as well to be able, again, to give you the advantage to be able to escape or to survive. So this is some of the shinobi aspects of working with the uh, gotanpo or the elements there. Next, we talk about the escapes of omote and uragyaku. So if someone's doing these wrist techniques to you, we talk about how to be able to escape them. And then this section is the fukia, which is the blowgun. So this is teaching you how to be able to use the blowgun. I talk a little bit about how it was historically made. And then again, you've got to do 7 out of 10 in a target at 20 feet. So you're again tested on it. So not only do you have to go out and buy yourself one or make yourself one, you've got to get proficient to be able to pass this test in the queues. Again, you're tested on everything. 
Still moving along, we got Yankyu, which is uh, still in the purple belt area. We're talking about Shumei's. Hon Jumei, Gyaku Jumei, Sankaku Jumei, Itemi Jumei, Hadaka Jumei. We're talking about different ways to be able to cut air and blood off to the brain. Then we learn about escaping the chokes because there's no reason to learn a choke and have someone choke you and you don't know how to get out of it, especially since they're so deadly. So we got some section here on being able to uh, escape chokes when chokes are put on you. Now we got some counter to throws. This is if someone's actually doing Ippon Seonage, Seonage, Sotogari, Gansaki Nage, different ways to be able to counter throws. So if someone's throwing you, this is how, what you can do to prevent it and counter it. This section here is the Ashigyaku Kion. This is basically locking up the legs, locking up the knees, locking up the ankles, locking up the calves. So here's four techniques to be able to do leg locks, uh, either by taking somebody down to the ground or they're on the ground and they go to kick at you and you're able to catch a leg. These are techniques you can do to someone's leg, like an arm bar, but locking out the legs. Then we have Tanto Disarms. This is if someone's attacking you with a knife and you're unarmed. These are techniques that you can do to defend yourself against being attacked with a knife. Moving on, this is Hensojutsu. This is the traditional way. We also talk about modern applications of it, but basically these are the seven methods that was used to uh, disguise yourself uh, in the traditional ways. You know, using yourself as a wandering priest, a shugendo, a salesman, a dancer, ordinary civilian. Ways that you could disguise yourself to move from territory to territory and not bring recognition to yourself. Next section here is edible plants. We teach people about different plants and we give them some examples, but it also depends on where you live. And we tell people to go out and collect me five uh, edible plants that are locally from you and go out and find them, clean them, uh, bring them into the dojo, uh, prepare them, and then I want to see you eat them. But I'm also going to double check what you bring to me because uh, I don't want someone dying in front of me. But uh, I, I, this is where you get exposed to medicines as well as poisons. Uh, but if you're out on a hike somewhere, there's, there's thousands of things that are around you uh, that can be used for either medicinal purposes or to be able to cause uh, pain and panic to your enemies. So I, I get people exposed to edible local plants. I do talk a little bit about some of the traditional stuff that was used in Japan, that was used in the 15th century. But I just say, hey, this is what they did. This is why they did it. This was the result of what they were doing. Now, let's go out in areas around us with things that grow native to us. And let's talk about some of the medicinal properties, the ways you can heal yourself, the ways that you can increase uh, your immune system, uh, things that can be used to help infections. Um, so a lot of people kind of like it or they hate it. You know what I mean? Some people are, are, are into this or not into this, but I expose everybody to it so they understand it. Moving right along, they get involved in Kusari Gama. So we're going to continue with the Kusari Gama. So whatever we were working on, where we left off, we're going to pick back up on it and continue to go further with the Kusari Gama. Then we get into hidden traps. So we get into building snare type traps, some of the fundamental rudimental ways. So um, this is kind of the basic military type things that you can use for like hidden traps. So we get out there and we teach people the different types of snares and wooden clasp and running trip wires and how to disarm them if they come across them or how to avoid them. Um, so if they're on a patrol and they're a point man, how to be able to look for things that are outside of the normal and then what to do if you come across one, um, what to be aware of because if there is a trap that's here, it could have been sitting there for weeks or months or it could be somebody that's already in an ambush situation that's waiting for this to spring um, to be able to attack. So there's a whole bunch of uh, knowledge that goes along with this. But we just show people what some of the uh, traps look like and how to build them. And we'll go out and spend a, spend a day in the woods and we'll build four or five of them. And if you're at this queue level, you have to go out there and do it. So if it's the middle of winter or whatever it is, you still got to go out, build something, take pictures of it, take a video of it, or get one of the instructors to go out in the woods to see exactly what you've done. And that's the on queue. And that'll get us up to Brown Belt finally. At Brown Belt, we get involved in tracking. So I teach a little bit of glossary as far as some of the terminology, some of the things you need to learn as far as to for tracking is concerned. Uh, and then the different combat tracking aspects to it to be able to determine what you know, direction the person was going, to be able to tell if they're walking, they're running, uh, how much weight they were carrying, um, broken spider webs, you know, all kinds of things that go along with just 
giving signals up that someone had been through this area and then how to track them. Um, this way you know exactly what you need to avoid so someone cannot track you. So at Brown Belt, we get involved in tracking. We get out in the woods. We have some people work on that. Let me get involved with some jute basics. So this is the jute, how to hold the jute, kamais from the jute. Um, once we get through the kamais of the jute, uh, we talk about how to do blocks with the jute. Uh, we talk about how to do strikes with the jute. And then we get into metabush and blinding agents. So we talk about um, different types of things that you can make from, you know, grounding up type of objects to using bear spray and pepper spray um, to using um, you know, ground up firewood ash uh, mixed with peppers and stuff and ground up uh, pieces of metal filings. There's a lot of things that you can do with uh, the metal bush, but it's basically any type of blinding agents. Um, you know, I, I work a lot with bear spray and pepper sprays, things like that. Uh, I do carry some of the traditional stuff. But a lot of times this stuff here, you really got to be careful. Um, it just it makes a mess all over you. It leaves a trace that you were there. Um, the old school stuff, carrying eggs around with you filled with this powder is just is unpractical. Uh, I used to use 35 millimeter cases for years. Now I'm just buying stuff that's already pre-canistered. It has a real good range, has a direction on it, has a safety pin. Uh, I can move around, jump, run. I don't have to worry about it breaking or poisoning myself if I'm carrying poison. So, um, but I do, again, teach the modern stuff. You know, we get out there. If dudes want to you know, boil eggs and do everything traditionally, we'll do it. We'll talk about the parchment paper, what everything you need to be able to do. But eventually we'll move to uh, the most effective modern way. And if you still feel that carrying the old way uh, is best for you, then, then fine. During testing, I want to be able to see some type of uh, ability to be able to blind to to stop multiple people so if you're attacked by 10 people what can you do to minimize those odds to be able to escape to be able to fight people in a one-on-one -on -one situation so that's my main purpose with the metal bush next section we're food moving down the trail with tanto jitsu so we're learning more techniques from the tanto jitsu section so we're getting better with our knife fighting skills so all these techniques are teaching you knife fighting skills then we're getting more deeper into the manriki kusari which is the way to chain um, still with the Totoru on the Manrique Kusari, so we're still still learning that. And then we got here is how to create sacred space. Um, basically, how can you make your own training training space outside? Uh, that's kind of the starting point for it. Um, how, how can you go out into the middle of the woods and clear out a small area and make like an outdoor temple or a place that you can train? Uh, once you've created this outdoor area, you know how can you continue to put energy uh, into that 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 place where you can go and you can meditate and, and you can heal uh, a place that you can go and you can feel safe uh, a place that you can go and do your own spiritual energy work so I, I teach people how to create an, a sacred space so they can get out and they can train uh, in an outdoor environment or in their living room or in a basement that they've kind of got a place that feels like a dojo that has energy so we'll talk a little bit about how to create a sacred space then we get back into hojo jitsu we start getting more advanced diamond type ties where we're, you know, we're tying up behind the back and we're doing more intricate ties. So that's kind of the, and these are not the ties that we do. I just kind of found this picture, but uh, these are the names from uh, the Ruha that we work with the uh, Tanto Jitsu, I'm sorry, the Hojo Jitsu. Um, and then we get into pace count. This is teaching people how to move. So this is, um, this is crazy. You're learning your own pace count. We're going to get out there and work a hundred feet and, um, you're going to see how many paces it takes you to go 100 feet. And then I'm going to you know, talk about slopes and winds and elements and clothing and visibility and different ways to break things down into meters and yards and things like that. So uh, this is this is really good. So I'll get people to learn like an azimuth for the compass, but they'll learn how to go. If I say, hey, I need you to meet me southwest 180 degrees and I need you to go, you know, <clears throat> two and a half miles you got to be able to break those miles down into feet and then know how many paces it takes to go a mile um, and then how many paces it's going to take you to go two and a half miles so you know how many steps to go so we end up at the same location. So this is basically just basic infantryman stuff, learning how to use your pace count and do, do math. Next, we get into five local dangerous plants. So I've got some examples of some dangerous um, plants here. And then again, we have the students... Um, not go out and get these, 
but we have them talk about. They'll bring to us, say, I live in this area. These are five dangerous plants uh, in my area that grow naturally. And uh, here's what they look like. And then here's what they'll do uh, if they're consumed. And this is, is it the leaf? Is it the flower? Is it the root? And um, how you can break it down. So this section here, uh, we have students, you know, talk to us about what locally grows dangerously in their areas. No one, they can avoid it, but also too, if needed, they've got it. Then we got rope skills, uh, how to fasten an anchor. Uh, we've got a whole bunch of rope skills on, on, on how to cross rivers uh, for river crossing and to move gear across rivers, uh, how to make a Swiss seat for rappelling. Um, so we get into ropes because uh, ro ropes are really important for moving uh, either up something, down something, across something. So your rope skills are really, really important. Uh, so this section here, we really get involved in that. And the most important thing I want to be able to see somebody do is have the proper length of rope to be able to make their own uh, own uh, Swiss seat with a D-ring. If they can put a Swiss seat on with a D-ring, I can get them across a river. I can get them if they're injured or hurt up or down a hill. So uh, that's very important. Everyone knows to do that. And then again, as always, you're tested on it. This will move us to the next to last queue. We get into Kukushin Hanbo Jitsu again. Again, a little bit more knowledge, a little bit deeper level. Uh, so we get people moving with the Hanbo. That's 15 techniques of the Hanbo. We continue with the Jute, and we get people working with the Jute, uh, with different techniques from Ruha's for the Jute. And we get into multiple attackers. <clears throat> this is teaching people to fight more than just one person where you've got two people standing next to each other, um, different scenarios, uh, a person on the right punches first. or you know, So there's just different scenarios of fighting multiple people, two, three, four, five people. So And we put them in a circle uh, with people around them so they learn to be able to maybe go at the stronger person first um, to, or to try to figure out who the strongest person of the group is so you can either fake towards that strongest person and then immediately attack the weakest person in that group uh, to be able to get a hole to be able to move. And when I say move, I mean run. Um, I'm not teaching you to stand there and fight five people. I'm teaching you how to be able to get out of that circle, to make people chase you, to use your skills to get into environments to where you can fight people one-on-one. -on -one. So this is teaching you how to get out of a jam if you're surrounded by people. Next, we get back into the sword. Uh, we're getting into the Yomote Kata, so I've got a whole section here of just different cuts with the sword to make you more proficient with the sword. This is defense against kicks, so this is getting into a little bit more complicated where you got someone who's an actual skilled martial artist and they're kicking at you very proficiently, how to be able to deal with those kicks. Um, more Kenjutsu, this is more Katas, this is the Ura section because we're in brown belt, a little bit more advanced of the Kukushinru Kenjutsu. We continue with the Manriki Kusari, getting your Manriki Kusari skills down. Uh, advanced Taijutsu, so this is getting into, I'm oh, sorry, Tanto Jitsu, so some more Tanto Jitsu attacks. And then we get into Kumite. In this section, you would use your stand up and ground game in a continuous fight for five minutes against multiple opponents. Your mission is not so much to win, but survive the entire five minutes without stopping for injury or giving up. This will build your confidence and your fighting spirit. So at this section here, yeah, it's in brown belt, which is, you know, someone's been training probably two and a half years or so, maybe. And we put them in a circle with five, you know, five, six, seven, ten people, and we just basically beat the shit out of them for five minutes. And all they have to do is just not cry and not quit and and um, and not get hurt. Um, and, you know, we're doing this in a way where it's a little bit of a hazing, but at the same time, uh, we're not trying to kill anybody. Um, but we want to make sure that you feel pain, you feel fear, and there's one point in this five minutes that your brain says, I need this to stop right now. And I need to see if you completely spaz out and freak out and start biting people. Or if you run for the door, uh, you know, I've seen all kind of people do all kind of things. But at the end of that five minutes, um, you're, you're usually uh, happy it's over. Uh, but at the same time, your, your confidence is going to go either way up or your confidence is going to go way down by you realizing that during that five minutes, um, you've got a lot of work to do on your on your spiritual fortitude, your physical skills, or whatever. You know what I mean? Now, I'm not just saying this is the only time that you do it. This is when you're tested on it. This happens as early as your first day. Uh, we do this on a regular basis all the time. Uh, we put you in a group of people, and 
Uh, we'll either yell out numbers. They'll come from all different sides. Um, sometimes we'll have two, three people on you. And um, in the very beginning, you know, there's not much you can do. You're just learning how to cover up and protect yourself as much as you can. And then slowly you learn how to be able to fight back. And then you, you get more and more comfortable in that arena. You get more and more comfortable with people coming at you, attacking you, punching you, kicking you, taking you down to the ground, you know, putting locks on you. Uh, they put a lock on you, you tap out. And as soon as, that per as soon as you tap out, that person with the lock lets go, but three or four people just jump right back on top of you. Another person puts you in a choke, you tap out, they let go of the choke, more people jump on top of you. You gotta learn how to be able to get back to your feet and fight these people off. So by this level of brown belt, what I'm trying to see is what have you learned over these years by doing this multiple times? How comfortable are you fighting? How comfortable are you in a stand-up game? How comfortable are you on the ground? And that's what that test is for. You're getting ready to go into black belt. And before you do that, I just need to see exactly where you are. Last section here is remote viewing. Uh, remote viewing is something I've been involved with for a long time. I uh, got exposed to it um, probably back in the early 1990s. And uh, I've read tons of books, been to a bunch of different uh, seminars, classes, and uh, I've paid some money to, to learn this. So I get people exposed to what remote viewing is. Uh, if you don't know what remote viewing is, kind of look it up. Um, but this is, uh, you know, where you get exposed to remote viewing and we do some some training to help you uh, see if you have a knack for it or just get you exposed to it because we will continue to do this later on uh, once you have your own school. Then we get into daytime uh, land navigation and terrain analysis where you learn different terrain features. You learn how to use a compass. Um, you learn how to put the compass together with the terrain analysis, your pace count. Uh, to be able to move group of people or get where you need to go. Um, how to move around objects with your pace count, uh, like a lake or a building, you know, how to follow an azimuth at night. So basically this is terrain analysis. Uh, determine your direction by the sun stick stone method. Um, there's using different ways with your compass or a watch. Uh, there's a whole bunch of ways. So I basically teach you how to find north uh, and your direction during the day uh, using these methods right here. And that's all of the second degree brown belt. That moves it to the last queue. You get Togakuryu Biken. We finish that out. So wherever we were with the Togakuryu Sword, we continue that out. You get exposed to Kukishinru Yari. And you get some techniques with the Yari. And you get uh, understanding how the Yari works. Um, Muto Dori. This is unarmed combat versus weapon from Kotaru. Uh, this is someone attacking you with a sword. And you being able to... Uh, escape and or disarm that sword and now we do we use a sword but we work with the baton we work with the baseball bat we work with the machete we work with knives so once you learn these techniques you know we'll put other more techniques more more weapons that you may see on a regular basis uh into your hands uh, so you can escape with there then we get into gun disarms um so we work with people so we worked on this section here where someone's coming at you with a knife a stick a bat a sword uh, anything, any kind of weapon you're working with that. This one here now, we start talking specifically about firearms. Not only handguns, but also shotguns and rifles. So we've got some techniques here, and there's a whole curriculum on self-defense on handguns. But at Brown Belt, this is where you start getting into that. Then we talk about marksmanship. So now not only, not only do you know how to uh, disarm a gun or, or, or retain your gun, uh, can you shoot a gun? So I go through all the systems of marksmanship from your position to your grips, to your breathing, uh, everything that you need to know about proper firearms training that I learned when I was in the military. So we'll get into, again, handguns, rifles, everything, uh, your different breathings, your breath control, your sight alignment, sight picture, everything that you need to be a relatively good uh, marksman. Uh, last part here, we got uh, hidden signals. We're talking about colored rices. Uh, we're talking about different rock formations uh, to be able to leave signals. So if you're out in the woods and you're moving and you want to be able to communicate with uh, someone of your own team um, there's, and, and you've lost communication, cell phone, satellite, whatever, you need to communicate with somebody. We're working with different rice or colors and we're also working on rock formations uh, to give hidden codes and signals out to people. Then we get into night land navigation. We did the daytime. So now we're going to get into the nights. You're going to work with the stars. Um, and the moon um, and, and, and how to make your compass glow at night so you can keep your regular compass lit up all night long but how to find uh, your north and south uh, using the stars and using constellations 
Um, your pace count at night is going to be a little bit different than your pace count during the day. So we talk about the difference you move between day and tonight. And then the last section here is uh, you need to make uh, an improvised weapon. And we talk about how to survive in your own home, you know, places like moving to your kitchen where there's knives and things, uh, what to do in different places of your house, things that you can do. Uh, what if you're outside in your attack, different ways of practice. And in general, we have somebody make some type of um, a weapon uh, handmade. So they've handmade a tanto, they've handmade a sword, um, they've handmade some type of self-defense weapon, a walking stick, whatever, that they've made with their own hands. Um, and then again, like everything else, you're kind of tested on that. Um, and then that breaks down the basic fundamental curriculum from white belt through the black belt. Once you get the black belt, all the training is 100% in the Ruha's, Kotaru, Gyokuru, all those different Ruha's. They're all in the Ruha's. Um, but your firearms training, your self-defense training, your ground fighting, all that just continues uh, as at the black belt level. We just go deeper and deeper and deeper down there. But uh, I've got students that have mandatory reading at certain things. I have certain students that have physical exercises. So they have like physical fitness tests uh, at different Q levels. So they're testing the students at how many push-ups or how long it takes them to run a mile, that kind of stuff. Um, swimming that's in there. So it, it, at certain levels, you have to be able to learn how to swim or prove that you can learn how to swim. So this curriculum can be changed and, and updated um, to anything that you want to add to take your training to the next level. All right, so wrap things up here. That's an example of what the United States Nippo Academy uses for its written curriculum. And again, it's not fixed in stone. It's very customizable. And um, I teach thousands of things that are not in the curriculum all the time. There's so much to this art. But what I'm looking to do is to say, hey, if you're interested in training in Nippo and you have no idea what the training is like, and you've looked at a bunch of videos of people doing taijutsu, 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 or weapons, or bow, or sword, um, Nippo is a very diverse art. And you can add anything to Nippo. You know, we were having a conversation not too long ago with some of my students, and, and Nippo is, is very much its own mixed martial arts. It's mixing not only physical self-defense, hand-to-hand -hand -hand combat, unarmed combat, uh, it's also mixing in, you know, in many cases, 18 to 36 different types of weapons. And in the Taijutsu, it's mixing different family systems, family systems that deal with Kopo Jutsu, uh, Koshi Jutsu, Jiu Jutsu, Dokken Taijutsu, these different styles of martial arts, you're mixing them all together under the umbrella of Nimpo. And then when you're adding in the modern self-defense practices of working with multiple attackers, working with someone that's coming in with a knife or a bat or a baton or a sword, uh, and you, if you can defend yourself against someone with a sword and you're unarmed, you can defend yourself a lot easier against someone that's throwing punches and kicks just as well. Um, but you have to practice the fortitude to have the courage to be able to fight back, think clearly in those situations. And that's what the training is designed to do. In many cases, there's hundreds of techniques and those techniques forge you into an individual. So you can do techniques on the spot. You may not do the technique that's in the curriculum, that's in the book, that's in the scroll, but all of that material has made you into who you are. And when you're attacked, you're going to respond by using the dynamics and principles to make things work. So the training is not so much what you're learning, very, very important, but how you've learned it, very important, how you've applied it, how you've made it work, and have you been able to make it work under stress and under pressure. So as you can see in the curriculum, there are different stages that takes you through all of those things. You get a great foundation, an opportunity to learn it, practice it, and develop it, but at each level, beginner, intermediate, and advanced, there's certain things that pressure test you to be able to put these things to work. So I hope you enjoyed the video to get an idea of what a NIMPO curriculum could look like. If you're training in a martial arts system and a lot of these aspects are not part of your martial arts system, take that responsibility yourself and add them. If you got any questions, you know where to find me. Best place is on patreon.com. Our Patreon members get everything online classes, live streaming classes, access to give me questions. I get to see their test. Their, their, I, they video send me their test. Uh, they don't even have to travel here anymore. So COVID's changed a whole bunch of things around. But 
I've decided to use Patreon as my main hub. I put the videos out on YouTube, and then all the training is discussed through the Patreon, through our live streaming, monthly newsletters, and articles that I put out there. So if you're interested in training, learning more about NIMPO, my Patreon page is a great place to start. I hope to see you soon out there in the world somewhere. Hope this COVID thing goes away. Hope we can all get back to training. Sign on.